Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamal Ilyas. I'm the director of the Wolf Humanities Center at Penn, which is um, the, very happy to be sponsoring um, this event together with our partners at the Penn Museum. Uh, and uh, we're very excited about it, and we take it as a good omen that the weather is nice uh, so that people can come and go um, well today. Uh, so uh, before I actually... Um, uh, what I'm going to be, I'm not going to be moderating the panel or introducing everyone, but I'm actually introducing my colleague um, at uh, the museum, Lucy Fowler-Williams, who will be um, essentially moderating the panel. Or uh, But before that, just one thing, I'd like to issue a land acknowledgement, which is that we recognize and acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania stands on the indigenous territory known as, known as Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the Lenape, also called the Lenape, um, the Leni Lenape, or the Delaware Indians. Um, and with mo so now, just to, in the interest of time, I'll introduce uh, my colleague Lucy. So Lucy Fowler Williams is associate curator in charge and the Jeremy Sabloff keeper of collections in the American section of the Penn Museum. A cultural anthropologist, her projects highlight Native American voices, material culture, issues of representation, and concern. She has worked her entire career on NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act of 1990, and as the chair of the Penn Museum Committee, has worked closely with the university and tribes to develop MOUs that step outside of the law to support recon reconciliation, cultural perpetuation, and partnership. Some of her collaborative projects with Native American specialists include the co-edited book, Objects of Everlasting Esteem, Native American Voices on Identity, Art, and Culture, which came out from the Penn Museum Press in 2005, the online Lewis Shotridge Tlingit Digital Archive, which is also put out by the Penn Museum and Penn Library, and the ongoing Native American Voices, the People Here and Now exhibition, uh, from Penn Museum starting in 2014, as well as Water, Wind, Breath, Southwest Native Art in the Barnes Foundation um, from t in 2022. She received her MA from the University of New Mexico and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and she's currently completing a book about Penn Museum's native Alaskan Tlingit curator, Lewis Shotridge, and a co-authored volume with Pueblo colleagues about the meaning and resilience of Pueblo cloth. So again, thank you. Thank you, Lucy, for joining for, for Okay, thank you so much, Jamal. And welcome, everybody. It's so nice to see all of you here today. We have a fantastic turnout for this event, and we're really thrilled that you are here in person and that we have a large audience online as well. So thank you for your interest, and thank you for coming to the Penn Museum. So again, my name is Lucy Fowler-Williams, and I am associate curator in charge of the American section here at the Penn Museum. And as I get started, I would love to recognize um, and thank some of my colleagues here at the museum who have made this project extra special. Jennifer Brem, the Merle Smith Director of Learning and Community Engagement. Tina Thomason, Associate Director of Public Engagement. Dr. Megan Kassebaum, Weingarten Curator of North American Archaeology. Williams Director, Dr. Christopher Woods. I also want to thank my colleagues in the American section who helped me on the work of repatriation, which we'll be speaking about tonight. Dr. Stacy Espenlob, Kamensky NAGPRA coordinator, and Bill Wurzbowski, associate keeper of collections here in the American section. So thank you once again. It's uh, an amazing program that we have organized for you tonight. We've been working on this for about six months, and I'm very privileged um, and honored to be able to speak with our Native colleagues who have come from a distance, Oklahoma and Massachusetts, and our other local um, specialists. So I think we're, you are um, in store for a really fun um, hour and a half, okay? We also have a lot of panelists, so we have a lot on our agenda to get through, and what I'm going to do is just give an introduction to sort of sort of stake out what's happening, um, to sort of set the groundwork for this event, um, and then I have asked each of our um, guests to speak just for five minutes, and then after that, as a group, we will talk for about 20 minutes. I will ask them a bunch of questions, and we'll have a dialogue together. Um, and then after that, at about 
6.10 or so, um, and Jennifer, I would love you to try to, if we get way off track, I want you to like frantically weave, okay? Um, uh, at about 6.10, I think we should open it up for questions for those of you in the audience and also um, those of you online can put questions in the chat, okay? And we'll be fielding those questions. Um, so just as an introduction, uh, I sort of want to set the stage for this amazing event that we've got tonight. So our program tonight on Lenape Hoking or the Lenape Homelands explores just some of the many impacts and legacies of European colonialism that have been and continue to be devastating and harmful to native peoples of our region. Perhaps the most significant feature of this legacy is their absence through historic dispossession of the Lenape homelands and their people's subsequent migrations west to Canada, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, Kansas, and Oklahoma. As you may be aware, today there are only three federally recognized Delaware Indian nations in the United States, and none of them in Pennsylvania, and none of them in New Jersey. Um, and they are the Delaware Tribe of Indians in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, the Delaware Nation um, in the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma in Anadarko, and the Stockbridge Munsee Band of Mohegan Indians in Bowler, Wisconsin. In Ontario, Canada, there are the Munsee Delaware Nation, the Moravian of the Thames First Nation, and the Delaware of Six Nations. So it is important to remember um, that this geographic dispersal and the diaspora itself is a product of colonialism. And that this understandably has created political differences among and between the related tribes. Now, there are also hundreds of other native communities across the country that for various reasons are not recognized by the US government, and some of these are actively seeking federal recognition. Recent examples of tribes in Virginia and New England have secured federal recognition, and some only after a many year process that includes very well documented legal battles. So the point that I'm making here is that tribal nation identity is in fact dynamic and ongoing. So in addition to these Delaware tribes and First Nations, the Lenape continue to have a strong modern presence in many communities where they're working to preserve the heritage of the Algonquian-speaking tribes of our region. There are state-recognized tribes in New Jersey and in Delaware, and while there are no state-recognized entities in Pennsylvania, the most recent federal census reports an American Indian population of more than 12,000 in our state of Pennsylvania alone. And some of these individuals work with us right here in our university and at the museum. So Penn Museum has a long history of anthropological interest in Lenape peoples and culture. And as a way of framing and grounding our conversation here tonight, I sort of wanted to begin our program by remembering and naming some of those Lenape tribal ancestors who, though they have now passed on, um, they chose to work together with Penn Museum staff in the early and the middle decades of the 20th century to share and better an understand Lenape perspectives. So there are probably more than I know about, but these individuals include legendary Lenape tribal members, James Weber, Reuben Wilson, and Nora Thompson-Dean. In addition, Interestingly, um, you should know that the museum houses 19th and early 20th century Lenape objects made by Willie Thomas of Anadarko, Joe and Freddie Washington, Willie Bull Doherty, Nick Peters, Joshua Montour, and we also house items acquired from Charlie Weber. So for me, remembering these names and um, the early hard work of these individuals reminds us all of the importance of this university and the museum as a place of learning and conversation, particularly around and through difficult histories of erasure and colonization. Their, the names actually help remind us of some of the very positive and special ways that our conversation tonight connects the past with the present and also helps lay the groundwork for how we all move with Lenape ideas and issues into the future. 
So with that, I want to let you know that our talk tonight builds, in fact, on two Lenape programs that we have held in just the past couple of months. Um, last September, our graduate student, Justin Reamer, I don't know if Justin is here tonight. Um, there, hey, hey, Justin, he's in the front row. Um, he introduced the archaeology of Lenape Hoking 12,000 years in the Lenape home homelands. And in November, a group of us took a bus trip to Trenton, New Jersey, where we spent an amazing day with state archaeologist Dr. Greg Latanzi, who is here with us tonight, one of our speakers. Um, and we looked closely at ancestral Lenape fishing and farming technologies at his New Jersey State Museum. And we took a very special walking tour of Abbott Farm. And this is the 2,000-acre ancestral Lenape archaeological village and historic site that is located literally in the center of Trenton, New Jersey. I just want to let you guys know there are a lot of seats in the front, so please come join us in the front if you wish. Um, so building on those two sessions, tonight's program highlights the important work and coming together of the Delaware tribes with this museum and museums across the country to repatriate Lenape ancestors and funerary objects removed from the Abbott Farm descendant village site in Trenton. That's the place where we took the walking tour. Um, and for over 16 years at least, and probably longer, we'll learn more tonight from our guests, um, for at least 16 years, Delaware federally recognized tribes have taken the lead in working to repatriate the remains of their ancestors who were excavated and then dispersed and studied in museums across the country over the past century. United States and Canadian Lenape nations held their private repatriation events quietly last spring at Pensbury Manor Historic Site on the Delaware River, and this is just north of Philadelphia. You know, you may, you may know that in the United States, the important work of repatriation occurs under the auspices of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and the acronym is NAGPRA. And this is a federal law passed in 1990 that authorizes all 574 federally recognized U.S. tribes to claim important items held in United States museums, such as the Penn Museum. And in this instance, the law aided the Lenape tribes in coming together to bring home and rebury their ancestors just a few miles from their original resting place. So tonight we are incredibly fortunate to have with us three Delaware tribal specialists and two local museum professionals involved in this important work, which while slow and difficult, I hope is bringing strength and healing as it renews connections to Lenape place, places and Lenape homelands. Um, as mentioned, I've asked each of our guests to speak for five minutes. Um, and so I would like to begin um, and call on Jeremy Johnson um, here at this end of the table. So Jeremy, if you would get us started, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Uh, hello, how are you all? My name is Lepoyokan uh, Katakum, Jeremy Johnson. I am Lenape, Shawnee, and Peoria. Um, I am truly grateful to be standing here, actually sitting here today. And um, I am happy that you all are here uh, to share this. Um, I am the Cultural Education Director for the uh, Delaware Tribe of Indians based in Barnesville, Oklahoma. I am in charge of cultural programming, consultations with museums, uh, educational institutions, um, any type of governmental agencies when it comes to NAGPRA, as Lucy mentioned, the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act. Um, we were in charge of uh, the repatriation of the, uh, our ancestors and the uh, funerary objects associated with those ancestors from many different institutions uh, across the nation. Um, and we continue to do that work. I don't know if I have five minutes at the moment. I just wanted to give, my, give an introduction um, because 
as Lucy said, the five minutes, I don't know how you sum up 20,000 years of existence of our peoples in five minutes. And so we're just trying to do our best of introductions and then hopefully we can narrow it down to the things that um, we can cover in this amount of time because otherwise uh, you will be sitting here for a week or more hearing me speak and I don't know how entertaining that would be, but it might be informative. So I just want to go ahead and say, Wanishi, thank you again for having me here and letting me take part in this and um, I look forward to the uh, conversation ahead. Okay, okay, this is on, thanks. Um, all right, so I'm just trying to think, what do you think, should we talk a little between ourselves now or should we move on, what do you all think? I think if you let everybody introduce themselves. Okay, and, and then we'll come back. Be, yeah. Okay, all back. right, so next I'd like to call on uh, Chief Daniel Strong Walker Thomas, who is at the end of the table. We're very happy that you got here. Um, Daniel, within good time. So welcome. Hello. Hey. It's our customary way that we would have allowed the female on the panel here to introduce herself, but I had asked her previously if she minded or if she wanted that honor, and she said, no, you please go ahead, go first. It's an honor and pleasure to be here with you. I'm coming from Eastern uh, Pennsylvania. I was doing some work down there with some community. And it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you to discuss both Lenape history, our presence, and our reclamation of our homelands. Onishi. Okay, and beside him, Caitlin Lucas. Hi, everybody. Oh, I think this is, I don't know if this is reaching me, but um, I'm Caitlin Lucas, uh, and I work as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Delaware Nation, who's based out of Anadarko, Oklahoma. Um, and so we manage things like Section 106 reviews, NAG for work, um, along with various educational initiatives for the tribe. As I'm not a tribal citizen, I just want to make that clear. Uh, I just work with the table. Okay. And Greg, Gregory Latanzi, yeah. No, you can just introduce yourself. I guess that's what's happening. <laughs> Uh, my name is Greg Latanzi. I'm the curator at the Bureau of Archaeology and Ethnography at the New Jersey State Museum in Trenton. Um, I've been there for about 22 years, and in that time have um, worked uh, part of my job uh, for um, using new NAGPRA and um, uh, during the repatriation of specifically Abbott Farm uh, archaeological site material. Um, so I've been working with uh, the tribes um, throughout since 2004 uh, and, and working to the fruition last uh, April um, in which we did that. Um, so. Excellent. Thank you. And finally, uh, Doug Miller. I'm Doug Miller. I'm the director of Pensbury Manor, which is the reconstructed home of William Penn here in Pennsylvania, about 25 miles upriver from here. And Pensbury now has 180 ancestors resting near where they lived, thanks to the work of everyone on this panel. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, Jeremy, I think I'd like to start with you. Um, uh, I know that previous to your current position as cultural education director of the Delaware tribe in Bartlesville, um, you served as assistant chief of the Delaware tribe. Um, and I wonder if you could share with us how this um, process and all of the hard work around repatriation has, has in your role brought the tribes together. <clears throat> that's a, that's very, uh, a good question. It's uh, one that may take a little bit of explaining. Uh, we have to understand where our uh, nations sit now where we are, uh, the spaces we occupy, um, and our history. We talk about Lenape Hawking, and we talk about how archaeology and science is catching up with the stories we've told. We've talked about time immemorial of occupying these areas of uh, Lenape Hawking. And at first, the archaeology was saying, oh, well, the archaeologists were saying, oh, it was 3,000 years of occupation. Oh, it went to 6,000 years. We had people arguing that. And eventually, we've been saying immemorial. 
I know that when you start looking at the history, we can start looking at that ice shelf, the, the, the ice age. We have stories passed down of um, a battle with the mastodons. And so we know we've been here as long as we possibly could have been. Now, let's break that down into more recent history. We had occupied this space for tens of thousands of years there. And within the last 400, we've been driven from our homes with eight forced removals, at, at least our community. The other communities, I'm only speaking on the Delaware tribal side, the Delaware tribe of Oklahoma, and speaking of our history because we do have a shared history with the Delaware Nation up to a certain point. And because of the uh, different leaderships and things, different peoples, different groups had to make different decisions, not the easiest decisions. And after the eight forced removals, we are all in different spaces now. Um, and we've been separated by time and distance in our own Lenape communities. And so one of the things that the repatriation efforts have basically facilitated in a good way is it's brought us together to work for a common goal to repatriate our ancestors back into the ground and to reinter them back into the ground where they belong, to get them off of the shelves in museums and private collections, to get them that permanent resting place once more, uh, to get them outside of the public gaze, to be viewed as oddities and curios. And so we are able, are able to come together as our uh, five Lenape nations we've talked about, the Delaware Nation, the Stockbridge, Muncie Band of Mohican Indians, the uh, communities in uh, Ontario, Canada, and the Delaware Tribe to work towards repatriating these ancestors who were initially buried with their own ceremonies and funerary objects and then dug up. I mean, they were buried, dug what? Or, uh, I'm sorry, Greg, what was the time period that we talked about when they were uh, initial burials? Oh, the initial burials? In the Abbott uh, Farms area. 100 AD, 200 AD. Talking about 100 AD, 200 AD. So they'd been dug up at that point and then placed in these collections. Mm -hmm. And so that was our driving force, to be able to talk about how do we get these ancestors. We don't think, we don't think about them as um, objects. Uh, artifacts. These are our grandmas and our grandpas. You know, these were in our lines of aunties and uncles and brothers and sisters, and they didn't deserve to be put up in shelves and studied and desecrated in the ways that they were. And so we, that's a common thing we could all rally around. And even the distance of time and the distance of space, location between our nations, we were able to rally around giving our ancestors peace, giving our families, our relatives healing. And so that was where these efforts really brought us together. Um, and it uh, all coalesced there in April of last year uh, when we actually were able to achieve that goal. And uh, we couldn't have done it without the, uh, our, our TIPOs in our, in our tribes, our tribal historic preservation officers. We couldn't have done it without that without them pushing, as Greg said, he's been working on this since 2004. Four. And so, and it had already been, uh, had, there were talks in the early 2000s uh, into the, you know, even as, as far as back into the 20th century, as we <laughs> like to say now. And um, so it's a long process and it was something that we finally were able to achieve and bring our communities together at least um, for that time and, and hopefully carrying forward to work together. Thank you so much. Really fantastic. Um, Daniel, I w had a question I want to ask you. Um, I have seen the beautiful film on your website about returning to homelands, which is about the youth in, the, in your community, Delaware Nation and Anadarko. And um, it's a really moving film. If any of you haven't seen it, just go on their website and you can find it. Um, about the youth coming back to this area, to the Delaware Water Gap. And I wonder if you could comment on sort of how this conversation of repatriation has also inspired you and your work in the community and how you're connecting with the youth um, and how this has, has been a healing and strengthening um, 
for your community, with a, kind of with a youth in mind. You know, here at the university, we're always dealing with the next generation and um, in a really exciting way, just sort of thinking forward. So if you could comment on that, that'd be terrific. Sure. So uh, in my introductions, I perhaps left out that my name is Daniel Strongwalker Thomas. I am the hereditary chief of the Delaware Nation. I am Turtle Clan. I am the grandson of Willie Thomas, whose articles in, are in this museum. And I'd like for a moment to connect with you as human beings. We're up here talking about the reburial of our ancestors. Do you know that we are the only group in America who cannot bury our dead the way that we want to in a culturally appropriate way? We have to ask permission. There's only been two races that we know of in modern history that has faced those same consequences, those same regulations. And that would be South Africa during apartheid. And as we know, they were returning to their traditional ways after apartheid. Our cousins in the Jewish concentration camps and Nazi Germany occupation, they were not able to bury their dead the way they wanted to during their time after the occupation had lifted they were able to return back to the traditional way that they bury their, their dead. Us Delaware, us Lenape, us American Indians, which is a political status, not a race, we're the only ones who still have to bury under cover of night in places we can't tell you, which is why this is a bit offensive as a Lenape man to be sitting here talking to a room of strangers about the burial of my ancestors. And I appreciate your interest. I appreciate your intrigue. I know there are friends in here. I know there are allies in here. I know there are enemies in here. But I hope that after this talk and after we visit for each other, with each other for a moment, that we'll all leave here with a better understanding. To answer your question, I just left an event at the watershed in Lehigh where the cast members, so to speak, or the participants of the Return to the Gal De Delaware Water Gap movie had returned to Lenape Oking for the first time in about 13 years since that movie had come out. Seven years, excuse me, since that movie had come out. And what that movie was, was the return of our youth to Lenape Oking, the very first time that some of our youth had ever seen the Delaware River, this beautiful space that we all share together, the Delaware Water Gap. Never had they seen cedar trees as they grow here because our medicine does not grow there in Oklahoma where we are in this barren terrain that we have learned, and just like every other oppressed society and people, to adapt and survive. You ask me what my youth think. They think it's not enough. They want more, all of it now. They want to come home and be welcomed by you. They want to come home to community. They come here as visitors, being brought around by tour guides. And during the making of the movie, they were told by national parks to stay on the path. Imagine that. Kyle, the director of the movie, at a recent speaking, had said the first question at his very first screening in the water gap with the very people who lived there, the very first question was, who gave you permission to go off the path? So my youth want to come home and share this beautiful space. And topics like this should not be the reason that bring us together. I appreciate everyone here who has done this and worked hard. I appreciate it. But we should not be disclosing the places that we rebury. This should not be a way to sell tickets to Pensbury Museum. Doug Harris, who's a good man who we worked with, he promised me he wouldn't tell anyone about this. Yet here he is, the first thing out of his mouth, telling you all how many ancestors we have on his property. My youth want you to not talk about that. My youth want their own space to bury their own dead, their own ancestors, a place where they can bring their children, their great-grandchildren, and generations beyond to a place where they can sit in silence and ponder and say, this is where my ancestors are. But as a result of the way things are in colonization, 
They can't do that. Many of them don't even know where they are. So I yield back to our moderator with respect and gratefulness for the safe space to have these hard conversations because they're charged with emotions from time immemorial. We are the inheritors of that trauma and we are the enactors of that change and together we can accomplish. Wanishi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Caitlin, um, could you tell us a little bit more about how your work also supports Daniels and um, how you were involved in this project or how you are comfortable responding? Yeah, so um, I started working for Delaware Nation around four years ago, so I was just coming in kind of at the tail end of the preparations and planning for the Pensbury reburial. Um, and actually our historic preservation at the time, she has since moved on to a new position. Um, so, you know, I can't speak a ton to the kind of preparations um, specifically for this, but um, I can speak to the hard work I really witnessed from both um, Delaware Nations TIPO at the time, uh, Delaware Tribes TIPO, and really like the years of planning that went into this. Um, and the significance of the, the event for everyone really involved. I think it was a great learning experience for, I know it was a great learning experience for me as a new, um, sort of soon to be TIPO, um, to kind of see those relationships form and kind of see the NAGPRA process through fruition. Um, that was one of my first experiences seeing that. So it was really, um, it was a really good learning experience for me. And what other work are you facilitating that is not about repatriation as the TIPO in sure. Allentown, Pennsylvania? I know that's where you're based at the Allentown Museum. Yeah, so Delaware Nation has an extension office in the homelands now um, to kind of facilitate all the work that we do, a lot of the educational initiatives. Um, but in addition to NAGPRA work, we do Section 106 reviews. Um, so Section 106 is part of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, and that just requires any agencies receiving federal funding um, for development projects to take archaeological sites into consideration um, and make sure that those are protected. So that allows the tribes, federally recognized tribes, the opportunity to consult on those and work to protect their archaeological sites, their sacred sites in the homelands, um, but also throughout all of the states of their forced removal period as well. So we consult on those. Um, and we work on a lot of different educational projects and initiatives. We've worked on everything from museum exhibit consultations, public history signage, school programs. Um, so our office really does a lot of diverse work for that. Yeah. Okay, would you put the microphone just a little closer to you? Yeah, it's fine. You don't need to repeat anything, but just okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Greg, I know that you have some slides um, that you wanted to show. And would you, are you comfortable doing that? Sure, I'm gonna plug my museum. Okay, very good. Go for it. Our tech is gonna help you. This is the New Jersey State Museum, uh, located in the complex in Trenton. And uh, this is the third iteration of the building. We used to be in the State House um, on the third floor and then um, in another annex building. But the museum started in um, 1895 as part of the um, Chicago uh, exhibition. And rocks and minerals were collected. In 1913, the first archaeological survey of the state was done, which was sponsored by the American Museum of Natural History. And it turns out the New Jersey State Museum has collaborated with other museums for, for many years, including this museum, um, when Dr. Frank Speck was an uh, anthropologist here. Um, and also work, he worked with um, archaeologists at the New Jersey State Museum. Um, so the work at the Abbott Farm um, in particular was done right after the Great Depression, 1930. Um, that's when actual excavations um, occurred uh, by the museum that was funded by um, the government. 
Prior to that, Charles Conrad Abbott, who was a curator here, um, lived on Abbott Farm, um, and he was the one who basically um, made notice of uh, artifacts and, and had the Museum of Natural History, the Peabody Museum, um, excavate. And part of, of those excavations, which went on from 1894 um, until um, 1941, um, were either at my museum, at the uh, University Museum of Pennsylvania, the Field Museum in Chicago, uh, Peabody in Yale, and some other places as well, which is why one, this, is, this was a, a long um, process to get everybody in line. Um, we also have other bureaus um, that started after archaeology or natural history, which wasn't called natural history, it was just called the State Museum. So cultural history in the 40s, um, education in the 70s, Bureau of Fine Art in the 60s. Um, so as Lucy mentioned, NAGPRA in 1991, um, our NAGPRA consultation for the State Museum started in 95. Uh, when we have the um, representatives of the federal tribes come to the Trenton and um, begin the work of identifying. Um, and so at Abbott, at 2004 is when um, more recent NAGPRA consultation individuals who were in charge of the, at the specific tribes came to the New Jersey State Museum and we re again re re-instituted, uh, you know, our inventories and things like that. And then right before the reburial, we did an intensive cultural affiliation study using archaeology, ethnography, oral history, and historical documents um, to help establish cultural affiliation going back um, to a certain time period. Um, and then uh, since we still have um, Ancestors at the State Museum, uh, we are continue, I'm sorry? No, sorry. Oh. Um, so we're continuing to work with the federal tribes under NAGPRA um, for the repatriation of the remaining ancestors. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Doug, I want to welcome you as well to the museum. And I know that you're um, interested in presenting Lenape interpretation of history and land uh, ownership in, in Philadelphia and land taking in Philadelphia. I know that you and I have talked about that, that you have an interest in presenting the Lenape, Lenape perspective on the land grab. Um, and William Penn, of course, at the Pensbury Manor, kind of his sons at least, had a bit of a role in that. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that effort um, and how, or, how close you are to that and how, how you're thinking about that. Sure. Uh, Penn is legendary and glossed over and gilded uh, and his relationship with the Lenape of course, is the stuff of, of legends. As a historian, one of the things that I'm interested in is multiple perspectives. And if we're going to tell history, uh, I had an undergrad team who taught historiography, and they always beat into my head, and this goes back to last millennia, go from the left to right, don't go down the center of the road because everyone's already heard it before. But the truth is, history is made up of multiple perspectives and should be multiple voices. And the voices that have been missing here have been the Lenape voices. So the legends of Penn, and there is still some reverence for Penn within the Native community. It is his sons who actually propagate the infamous walking purchase, which begins the forced removal for many Lenape ancestors who work here. And if we have the opportunity to use my site, Pensbury Manor, as a platform, and Pensbury being one of the sites of the Historical and Museum Commission, states 
history agency, then that's a very good thing. Having the opportunity to work with a variety of tribes who came to Pensbury, who historically were one people, through forced removal, are five groups who have 250 plus unshared histories because of that forced removal and colonialism. That's a good thing. My niche market at the school are school children. We will have thousands between now and June. And kids live in a very complex world today. The stories we're going to tell are complex, but they're up to the challenge. And we do a disservice to the youth if we don't offer those multiple perspectives. So that's the aspiration for the site. I do have some programming scheduled for this spring. And we want to continue that work. We're also working with an indigenous artist whose medium is sound art. And it's a different opportunity to use the platform of William Penn's home to introduce people to the first people who were here. Thank you. That sound art project sounds really interesting. Is that a Delaware tribal uh, member? It is a Delaware tribal member named Nathan Young. Nathan previously had served on tribal council. He is a sonic artist. I, I have to, uh, full disclosure, I haven't heard it yet, which is kind of scary, but if you actually want to let an artist work, you shouldn't be prescriptive. So uh, we will be opening that to the public on tax day. So if you don't want to worry about your federal taxes, but when you, you would like to uh, experience something, Come on out to Pensbury. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we have another few minutes. I have another round of questions for you all. So, um, Jeremy, I would like to ask you from um, your perspective, um, what are some of the most important or interesting historical questions or research questions that you might be interested in working on, learning more about? Um, and I say that in part because, you know, we need to figure out how, um, how we might work together on questions that might be useful to your community, that might be of interest. You know, and is there, a, is there an opportunity for that? And, you know, maybe that's the second question. The first question is sort of, as, you, as the cultural educator that you are, um, how are you sort of deepening your, and in what areas your interest in Lenape questions, histories? Um. One of the things that we're, it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer, honestly, because um, when it comes to our histories, you know, we're pretty confident in what we've been told, what's been passed down. And so, um, but there are resources that we would like to look at, the uh, first-hand historical documents uh, and reinterpret those from the perspective that we see it. We know what happened. We've got those stories passed down. Um, I'd like to, we don't get to see, we hear a lot about our histories from other uh, anthropologists, archeologists, historians, but we're never really provided that firsthand, here's the documentation of our interaction, we'd like to reinterpret those. We'd like to see those and say, hey, this matches up to help us fortify our own histories and knowledge that we do have, but in the ways that make sense to us. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily who this person was, we're really looking for our ancestral names, we're looking for our, our, our relatives, our, our family members. You know, and that's, that's something that we, uh, we're working with in some different, um, Institutions, I believe, uh, Westchester is one with some archive, archival uh, documents there. Uh, maybe some copies of some primaries that we can't get our hands on, but we're still trying to do some of those things. Uh, because it's, it's really kind of cool to see T.D. Skung's diary, you know, mm -hmm. or at least the, not necessarily what he was writing, you know, the, the recording of what was happening with him and his son, John T.D. Skung, you know, when we're talking about Ohio and, and those things. And so those things really interest me. But for the most part, it's really kind of a, a, a tough question because what our communities really are needing are support in, um, you know, uh, preservation of traditions and our cultural ways um, and our language revitalization uh, uh, projects. 
Um, those, that's really where we are uh, focusing in our cultural education is providing that to our youth. Um, and I say our youth because uh, a lot of our kids have been left behind by um, just the process of assimilation and the attitudes of some of our own community members had, we're having to overcome those now to say that, hey, this was a survival tactic of assimilation and embracing some of that. Some of our community members did. I don't hold that against them. It's a reality, you know. And so a lot of these things weren't passed down because it was survival. It was a survival mechanism to not teach a language to your children. Mm -hmm. That is what it truly was. And when I was younger, I was usually up, I was upset about that at first. Why did my great grandma not teach my grandma except, if, you know, for, except for a few words, a few phrases, those things? Why did she not do that? And then you realize why. As you get older and you start to realize the boarding schools, you start to realize the, the fact that the, uh, basically the language was beaten out of her. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we struggle with on a day-to-day -day within our community, um, is passing those along to re-engage our community members to um, embrace what it means to be a Delaware tribal citizen and a Lenape person. So, um, so that is kind of a tough question um, in the sense of uh, what interests us. My interest is really within my community. Mm -hmm. you know, and anything can help to re-engage those individuals in my community and to carry on is what we are interested in. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. And Daniel, building on that, um, what role do you see that institutions like ours can play in supporting your community? Looking at one of the most dangerous organizations, according to the American government, the Rainbow Coalition started by Fred Hampton which I now sit at the seat of with Fred Hantum Jr. and the others, I would say, coalition. You can help us by helping us create community, by giving us these spaces to meet with ourselves and amongst ourselves and with our community who here is, some of you I bet have uh, had family members on this land, Lenape Yoking, for hundreds of years. So we share these now, we share these lands. So Penn Museum can help us and our institutions like this can help us by one, providing the space to talk because many of you would know how dangerous it is for me to get here, to sit here, to be here. It was only at one point that Benjamin Franklin put a bounty on our scalp after the walking purchase which stole thousands if not millions of acres from Lenape people through outright fraud. And so my hair, my child's hair, female's hair were commoditized, made, commoditized, made into money. Benjamin Franklin and others would pay top dollar enough to buy land and enough to buy a home and build it just for the hair of our heads. So to come here and feel safe amongst you, amongst most of you, is a good feeling. And when I speak with my youth who just left, they're on a plane now flying back to Oklahoma, they want to know you. They want to meet you. So by being a, a, speaking from my people's point of view, you see, I don't work for my nation. I'm not employed by my nation. I speak for the people. I work terrifically with our executive council and our, our beloved president, Deborah Dotson, who was our first female president in her second term. And she won by the largest margins we've ever seen, bringing that matrilineal balance back to our community. But speaking for the people, frankly, with love, respect, and kindness, and you can give the articles back why is this a process? Why is this arduous? 
It seems humane. It seems logical. It's ours. My brother Jeremy talks about holding a diary, asking permission to hold a diary so he can look at it and have our people reevaluate it, which is a beautiful goal, brother. But wouldn't it be better to take it home to our people so that for generations they can read it and we can have these things? It's not an us versus you. It's a we. We need you. We need your love and support to come home. Continue to provide these spaces for us. But also understand that there's some that work against us actively. Some members who I believe are in the room. Who they create 501c3 nonprofit corporations and then pretend to be a race. Since when is a corporation a race? I've never seen that. And so you can stop giving non recognized groups platform. How dare you enter into the conversation of who is and who is not Lenape? We are fully capable of handling that ourselves. We do not need outsiders to prop up, to give voices to groups that are not vetted, groups who have no ties to any of our five communities, none. So you can stop the violence by providing platform opportunities and weaponry, frankly, to the people who are working to erode our sovereignty. You see, we're a very humble people. The Red Road is able to walk any of you can. It's not based upon where you were born or how you were born. If you believe like we believe, you want to be in tune like we are, please do be. Please do be. In fact, I have some to learn from someone in this room, I bet. However, taking our identities and then a powerful organization such as Penn Museum, giving them platform without any vetting. It's violence. It's cultural violence. Why? Because they're easy. They're the low-hanging fruit. They're jumping to participate. We want in. We want in. We want to work too. But calling Anadarko, calling Bartlettsville, that's what you can do. Calling our Stockbridge Muncie Mohican community. I believe there's many exhibits in here that have gone on with the Lenape theme. And I bet I can count on one hand how many we've been consulted on. So with honor and respect and with the platform, and I dare go against some normities and be a civil, and I dare fall into the realm of the savage speaking my mind. I think you're capable of hearing this. I think you're capable of reacting to this in a good way. I think this is the generation who's going to finally embrace the Lenape people, make what's right, bring us home, and that is what your institution can do. And even though we may have had a rocky past, today is what we have to look at, and going forward is what we have to dream of. So today you've done good. You've brought my people here in a good way to talk. You've given us space and platform to speak to good people. What will the future hold? And that is the challenge. How can we work together to ensure the strength and validity of the children who are yet born of Lenape descendancy? Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Caitlin. Um, I know that you're working on your dissertation at Temple, specializing, um, sort of focusing on Lenape sovereignty in scholarship, and your effort is to explain and show a literary history of representation of Lenape nationhood and to illuminate the impact of Lenape nationalism on colonial and American politics as well as tribal practice. That sounds like quite a project, and I wonder if you would tell us a little bit more about that, um, and perhaps focusing on this issue of sovereignty, yeah, drawing that out. I really appreciate the question, um, but I think I would probably prefer to 
kind of cede this time back to Jeremy or Daniel or whoever okay. wants to share, um, just to kind of, if they wanted to refocus back on the Pensbury or, you know, whatever you would like to prioritize. I don't need to, I don't need to talk about myself. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, would you like to elaborate or how about you guys? What do you think? Does anybody? Well, Caitlin, who will not toot her own horn, I call her sister. This woman I sit next to has sat through many a battles with me through institutions who just simply didn't get it. What do you mean you want this returned? What do you mean you want to look at this? It's ours. What are you talking about? So my sister here is working on a dissertation that will finally and hopefully explain history from our points of view, highlight different lenses. And so I really would like to acknowledge her and thank her for that work. Um, she really does do tremendous amount of work in a, such a humility way, with a, a way with humility. So, Wanishi Caitlin from the Delaware Nation and the people for the work you do. Thank you. The last thing without uh, holding this microphone hostage too long. The work in scholarship, it seems, what happened to academia? Where, is, where are the skeptics? It seems whenever a new path is blazed, there's so many people who are willing to say, yes, yes, yes. These new stone cairns that are discovered, these new tribal lines in, 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 in books based upon Lenape history and such, but no consultation for the people. I call and challenge, and I ask my own question. In academia, is it really publish or perish so bad that you'll write something that has no basis in truth and reality just to support your book sales? Is really blazing a new trail and being one of the first to publish about a people who still exist and thrive as if we're in the past, is that really the way to go? In this beautiful era of diversity, equity, inclusion, we do not want to move the scale backwards. We celebrate with all of our brothers, sisters, and however they identify at the table. This is a time where we accept you as you present yourself to the table. What a powerful time to live. What a beautiful time to live. However, the American Indian identity is being swept up in that because as soon as someone presents themselves as American Indian, you're saying, okay. So let's relearn some cultural norms. And as uh, I take the mic because my sister was going to discuss her work in academia, I focus it back on academia. Academia, I challenge you to reach out to us directly before you publish a book. Doesn't that seem right? Doesn't it seem right? I often challenge you all to hold academia accountable because it's your book sales that uh, dictate what they write. So thank you, Caitlin, for all you write and the research you're doing with the work that you stand upon and all the work that you know, others are doing now to bring the truth to light. So Wanishi, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think it's now time to turn us out to the audience. Okay, so um, for those of you who are here in person, we have a microphone. Um, Jennifer and our tech colleagues are going to run that out to you. So maybe you raise your hand and they'll come to you. And those of you who are online, you can also put your questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to go and field those at the podium. Hello, NC Shelley DePaul. I'm from the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania, clan mother of Lenape Nation. And we're so excited to be here today, and we're so excited to hear from you. We've come here today representing the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania, uh, the people who remain behind here, and who are all descendants of Lenape ancestors here. Also, the Ramapo tribe and the Nanakoke tribe and Northern Delaware tribe of Lenape people. And we have come here today to say we are so grateful that you are here and we welcome you here today. 
And so the people in this room that are here, that have come here to do that, and the people uh, on Facebook or chat or what is it, Zoom, if you'd all just put in the chat, welcome to our brothers and sisters whom we're so grateful to have here. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Well, since there was no question there, it seemed like a comment. May I say, as a human being, as a human being, thank you as one human being to another because irregardless if we disagree, I respect your right to live as a human being. I respect your right to be as a human being. You deserve love and compassion as a human being. But miss, with all due respect, your candy glazed welcome is really passive aggressiveness and you know it. You wish that you want to appear humble in front of this crowd as if you are humbly coming here to say hello to us. This is not the forum relatives meet, miss. If you are claiming to be our relative, why haven't you visited us in Oklahoma? Why ha no, you haven't. You haven't. Do not tell mistruths in front of these good people. You haven't. Why do you sell our language, Mr. Paul? Why do you sell our language to Swarthmore and others? Um, as soon as I get an answer, perhaps from mine. So, why are you selling and commoditizing the Lenape culture and language? How dare you cash in on the genocide of my people and start a 501c3 non-profit corporation, solicit donations as if they're helping the people, which we have never met. So anyone who has given you funds has funded the opposition. It's a bit as if allies would fund and help give arms. So ma'am, why are you commoditizing our, our culture? And then two, why do you believe this is the appropriate forum to bomb us when we're talking about our ancestors, when the focus is on ancestors? You believe this is the time for you to shine. That is not Lenape way. Humbly, yes, please. We are Lenape people who have remained here for all of these years, and we have our own history and our own struggles of how we had the hiding time, how we had to get through. We have documents on the, the ancestors that live here. Everyone in our tribe is documented. I've Maybe pulled up your website, oh, and on your website, are, all you have to do is Are you interrupting me? I'm not, I'm not finished yet. Well, thank you, ma'am. We're very grateful to have you here. Thank you. And we wish to work together. But can you say, honestly, that you believe that no Lenape people remained here? Oh, what a terrific question. Yes, I can honestly say no Lenape people stayed here. And let me explain why. One thing colonizer is amazing at is making money, is turning things into money. The first thing that they commoditized was our brother the beaver, which we almost hunted to extinction on behalf of the colonizer so that we could feed their need for hats and belts and whatnot. The next thing that they commoditized were the woods and the timber. Boy, they shipped off and cut those down and sure shipped them across seas to build boats, which they would later use to bring more people here. They commoditized the people of all the islands that they touched first, because let us not forget that Columbus and his group of rascalians landed up first upon the islands that are known as the Caribbean. And let me give respect to my Taino, Arawak, and other communities who are descendant of them. When it was for Lenape people, we were pushed out in the 1700s at the end of a gun. At the end of a gun, children were killed. Massacres happened on a regular basis. And to believe that anyone of my skin complexion could pass in your society without you noticing me is a myth. And to believe that you could hide in the woods because that's too far for colonizer to go. They'll jump in a ship and they'll come all the way over here and they'll go all the way west to manifest destiny, but they'll leave you alone in the mountains. Why? We would never leave children behind. My brother will back me up. Anytime a child a parent's child would have died. Another Lenape family would have picked that child up and raised them as their own. 
We would have never left anyone behind. But now let me play devil's advocate because intellect says, well, is there any definites? Is there any infinites in this world? Hmm? So let me play devil's advocate. Who would be able to stay behind? Maybe people who looked more like you or more like others. And they chose if they stayed behind, which we don't believe anyone did, but if they did, they chose to cash out of the Lenape people and cash in on new society because Lenape people were not citizens until 1924. We would not have any civil rights until 1968 and we were not allowed to practice our religion until 1978. So your ancestors, Mr. Paul, have had hundreds of years to advance themselves, buying property, buying land, owning businesses, conning people out of land, getting money any way they can, and here we are again. Rather than mining the trees, rather than mining the land, they're now mining their DNA. They want to mine their DNA so that they can cash in or escape the trauma of being the descendant of a settler colonizer. Yep. So, ma'am, with respect, no stay behind. Okay. 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 Thank you. I'm going to now take a question um, from the online audience. Um, and this question, like several questions are sort of zeroing in on this. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the role of federal recognition in this process? Is the government recognition, is government recognition or blood quantum or colonizer measurements of authenticity what makes it official? And do you recognize that there may be Lenape descendant communities who remain in Lenape Hoking? Jeremy, that was directed to you in this instance. The federal recognition process is what we utilize in NAGPRA for uh, any, any institution that receives a federal dollar has to abide by that and we utilize that in that way. Um, we know we've had to, uh, we lost our federal recognition as the Delaware Tribe of Indians. And we regained that federal recognition because we had a clear, distinct line of culture, tradition, and heritage uh, from, as we want to say, basically from contact is where they start recording that. And so we establish that and we establish who we are. And so it is only right in our minds for people to be hand, who handle our ancestors to have that same establishment of who you are. We had to prove it and we did. And it seems only fair that I don't want strangers handling my grandparents remains and so that's why we utilize the NAGPRA and the federal recognition because we've had to prove who we are over and over and over and we've never once said we aren't Lenape even in our current position Delaware tribes not the Delaware nations Delaware nations in a different position than we are we are one of the most unique positions in, out of the tribe in the United States as we have an MOA with the Cherokee Nation. We were forced to sign this agreement in 1867 in order to not starve in Kansas. And so when we came into Oklahoma Territory, we had to reside within the Cherokee Nation bounds. And there are many limitations put upon us by that agreement, and they're still in place today. And there was a re-up of that MOA in 2006 with our tribe in the Cherokee Nation. I did not agree with this. It was the leadership at the time, but it is a reality of where we sit today. And the reason we've had to have that is because we would not agree to give up our Lenape status. We, didn't, we would not agree to not call ourselves Delaware or Lenape and to be, start calling ourselves Cherokee. We did not agree to put away our cultural ways and our traditions and our ceremony and adopt the, that that way. And so we stood up. We ended up losing our federal recognition because the Cherokee suit is basically a breach of contract 
uh, basically the most basic way to understand that. And we fought and fought because we said we have never once not said we were Lenape or Delaware peoples. And we maintain that identity from the first contact with Verrazano in 1527. Thank you. I have another question I'd like to ask that's coming in from the chat that might really be interesting for several of you. How does the science and technology of archaeology intersect with the beliefs and interests of the tribes today? Um, so one of the so one of the things um, uh, that cultural affiliation um, does and. I noticed um, having, you know, worked with the collections um, and with the Nagpur collections um, and speaking with the tribes about, you know how we all go to cemeteries to see our loved ones and some of us put rocks on the tombstones and some of us put flowers. Well, the Lenape went back and had a feast or time and time again. And sometimes they would leave objects. And that history with the archaeology basically fit. We were able to see that. We were able to see that in the records from the 30s and 40s. So that way we were able to identify post-ceremonial ritual internments of feasting and the artifacts and everything that went with it. So when we are, well, the museums that receive federal funds, like mine, when we have to um, make the inventory of what has to be returned, we increase the amount because of this new information. And as far as, and archeology span helped us do that, along with speaking with the tribes. I want to add to that, yes, because as we've, we've already spoken about, our stories tell how we did things and where we were. And so it's good now, we haven't, it hasn't always been the case, that the archaeological, the anthropological, the scientific community is starting to listen. Uh, we're demanding that they've listened. You know, more now, we have a lot more, I feel, um, we have a lot more power in our, in our communities and our sovereignty that we are able to start demanding some of these things to change. And uh, we are willing to walk away when we aren't heard now. Uh, this has happened multiple times. This hasn't happened in the past. Our leaders' hands were often tied we, had a, we still have a scarcity mindset in some of our, our communities uh, from the past, from the past traumas. There's a scarcity mindset, and there's this, still this idea of we want to be, there's no better way to put it, the good Indians sometimes. And so with these newer generations and with these things, with this idea of sovereignty, and again, I think there's a resurgence of Native pride, Indigenous pride, especially the Nape pride, that we are able to say, hey, we want to work with you, but you have to listen. And I will say that that's informing a lot when it comes to archaeology and anthropology now. And we're also starting to say, you don't get to decide what is funerary or culturally significant. That is for us to decide. We're still fighting that battle. We're still arguing with institutions of, hey, we want this back. It is culturally significant, but that's ours. That's, we have the provenance to prove that we got this legally. We don't care. I will say at one point, we're, we'd like to look at a Harrington, the Harrington Collection, not only here, but at the Smithsonian Institute. I know it's kind of, I'm taking a little bit of a turn, but this is what we're talking about is meaningful relationship building. We want to look at the Harrington. Harrington came in 1906 to Oklahoma and exploited our people. We were at a time where we were 20 years removed from Kansas. We were at a time where we were in a transitional period of our traditionalists trying to maintain their ceremonial ways and their big house ceremonies and those types of things. And 
also trying to survive. We're talking about 40 hour work weeks. We're talking about well, not even 40. We didn't have the labor unions at that time, right? We're talking about pre. We're talking about 80 hour work weeks being forced to go work in fields. You're talking about Oklahoma, so you're mainly going to be talking about agricultural work. And so our, our folks are forced to participate in this form of society in, in, in order to survive, to assimilate. And Harrington came and took advantage of those people. He came and bought, purchased items for pennies. I know my, one of my uh, relatives, who was my uh, great, great, great grandmother's second husband, had sold 12 strands of wampum they were once used in the big house ceremony. I don't remember if I got to see the chit for that, but I believe it was about $6, or 20, maybe it was $26. It wasn't much. We're talking about pennies on the dollar. So what my point being is that we're looking at the archaeological aspect here with, like, with Greg, and he's, we're, we're building this, this uh, relationship of saying, this is what we think, and they're now being able to say, you know what? You're right. We're hearing that more and more. But we still have a lot of way, a long ways to go. And we're basing what he knows informs some of our uh, knowledge again because we have lost a few of those things when it comes to these these day-to-day uh, in that time period. We still evolved. We changed. So we incorporate some of that knowledge into our teachings and our learnings as well. So... Uh, I hope that kind of answers the question. I know I veered a little bit, but I'm hoping that that oh, helps. That's really helpful. <laughs> um, I have an interesting follow-up from an indigenous person here. Um, and the question is directed to Jeremy, and that is, do you feel that the federal government's role in determining which indigenous communities are recognized as indigenous or not undermines our sovereignty as indigenous peoples, especially given the ways in which settler colonialism actively has worked to erase indigenous peoples and their presence. Yeah, that was a simple question, huh? <laughs> I'm only going to speak for my tribe. I'm only going to speak for my tribe in our... In our um, our experience again um, I feel that uh, there are other fights that's not mine I know that like I said we've had to prove over and over and over who we are and we're okay doing that I'm not going to endorse anybody else having to go through that I'm not going to I'm not going to um, uh, talk about that at the moment. I just don't, we have a stance against, uh, we have a resolution against fabricated tribes that uh, our, our tribal council and our community had agreed upon and standing behind that, I say that we endorse the process because it coincides with the stories we know to be true within our community. Thank you. Um, and now another question. Um, two questions, actually. One is perhaps a quick question for Caitlin. Not sure that's fair, but let's give it a try. Um, should local people get in touch with you as the TIPO um, or, you know, to be the conduit to the Lanape communities about potential burial or cultural sites that they believe are on their land? And if so... Um, how would they do that? Would they reach out to you specifically? And perhaps Jeremy has a TIPO as well. So is the TIPO role the one? Yeah, so I think the long and short of it is that everything I do um, go, ultimately goes back to Delaware Nation's tribal government and their executive council. So any sort of information that gets in my hands ends up going to them. So in that way, um, I do serve as a contact, a kind of presence on the East Coast that people can reach out to. Um, all of my contact information is on Delaware Nation's website yeah. if they need that. Okay. Um, but I strongly encourage anyone to reach out to the tribal governments directly as well, to, okay. to either Jeremy if they have his contact information, to Daniel. Um, but yeah, so yes. Okay. Depends on the, the nature of the, the question, but yeah. Thank you. And now I have a question that is also a follow-up for Daniel. Um, and that is, could you expand on your earlier comment regarding indigenous identity? American, and 
in quotes, American Indian is a political status, not a race. And the question is, what is the difference between race and indigeneity? It seems like a well thought out question and I appreciate it. And I think it's poignant. I think it speaks to the, to the issue. There's multiple lenses to look at it. The legal lens, which the court has ruled that you could be 100% indigenous, but without a connection to a federally recognized nation, you are not American Indian. The next one is a lens of race, okay? And this gets complicated. My race is Lenape. I also happen to be Oneida. Um, I'm here representing the Lenape community, Delaware Nation. My race is Lenape. My political status within the United States of America, based upon my association and connection with the Delaware Nation, a federally recognized nation, is American Indian. American Indian is a status bestowed on the descendants of those who are due treaty rights and are part of established, recognized communities since the invasion. So race is not the topic here. Many of you may be shocked to learn that reservations are much like POW camps. That's what they are. We are prisoners of war here. We lost the war. Our conqueror agreed. Not, we're not conquered people, I'm sorry. Our attempted conqueror tried to um, put an end on us and put a, an expiration date on us through... Um, identity and through blood quantum. And so my nation does not use blood quantum. My president, Deborah Dotson, and our executive council got rid of that. And so the identity of an American Indian is based upon their connection to a federally recognized tribe. And I'll expand on it briefly and leave it here. When my brother Jeremy and I come out here for a hunt, when our nations ask us to come for a hunt, we don't have to apply for licensing. Why? Well, this has always been our lands. We have the right to hunt here. Treaties say we have the right to hunt here. They don't give us the right. They affirm that we've always had that right. When a state creates a tribe, they create a race because the state has no treaty obligations to a nation which is the sole proprietorship and oversight of the federal government to make treaties the only one allowed to treat. Shoot, if the Civil War taught you anything, it should have taught you that dissent and having your own opinion as a state is not an option. So, if you do not have the federal recognition you are not an American Indian, and when a state creates that race, they create a group of people that they then give special privileges to based on what? Treaty obligations? No. Based on race based on race, and isn't that against the Constitution? Citizens of Pennsylvania, when someone who's, or, or New Jersey, or others, if a state allows a group of people based upon their racial identity to have non-status, non-profit status for their groups, they don't have to pay taxes, they get to hunt for free, that's against the Constitution. And so the federal government is the, only gov uh, is the only authority to deal and to make treaties. And some of these corporations that pose as indigenous nations actually ask people to sign treaties. They get on our Delaware River, like how hokey. They get on the river and they ride down the river and they stop at institutions and colleges and they say, sign this peace treaty with us. How offensive. The word treaty is indicative of deceit, of dishonor of lies, and the U.S. government is the only people who are allowed to do treaties. What do you call it when a nonprofit organization and a scholarly institution, such as this, uh, this one or others, come together? It's called a MOU. <laughs> it's a memorandum of understanding or a memorandum of agreement or a contract. It certainly isn't a treaty. So American Indian's identity based upon treaty rights guaranteed to my ancestors through recognizing our nation. It's not my race. Thank you. Okay, I think we have 
time for uh, one more here and then one more there. Uh, what is considered culturally important to the Lenape people? Is it every item that belonged to the tribe or is it select items? Jeremy, would you like to take I'll tackle that one. We can, we determine that, plain and simple. That should be the, the, the question. Mm -hmm. What do you feel is culturally significant and we respect that? Doesn't matter. It should be simple as that, honestly. I mean, we probably won't take a lot of flint shards, you know, napping. We're probably not going to take a bunch of that, that stuff. We're not going to say that's, it, it is culturally significant if that's done, but we have enough examples of that. But what is culturally significant? We're going to be, we get to determine that because it's our culture, it's our traditions. So I think that that is lost a lot in the conversations, and that's what causes a lot of arguments. It's not, a negotiation. You know, we're not going to negotiate our cultural values and traditions. And that six, the requirement of consultation in NAGPRA should certainly leave it there for you. Thank you. Jennifer, I think, uh, is there someone in the audience who has a question? We have a couple of more. I know we started late, so we're going to go another couple minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Real quick, my name is Jim McCreary. Can anyone speak to the cultural significance of Matinkunk Island with the, the island of Tall Pines in Burlington, New Jersey? Thank you. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with this. This, is, this goes back to our removal from our homelands and our understandings of the own, our own lands that have our names attached to them. There are some things that we can, uh, we can determine the cultural significance because the names that are left, for example, um, uh, Hupukin, uh, Hupukun, which is Hoboken, Hupukun, pipe. If you go there, clay deposits, makes sense. You know, those, those are the types of things that we can, we can look at now. So honestly, I, I, I do apologize. I don't know of any of the cultural significance. And that speaks to our removal and what we've lost during that process of our eight removals. You know, we have to go back and with the loss of our language uh, being spoken fluently within our communities, we lose the history. Because our names aren't just arbitrary. The names we assign to places were not arbitrary. They were indicators of why you would go there or what you would avoid. You know, you're not going to go to the, the, the place where the ground is sharp, or at least you're going to try and go around that place. I can't tell you the name of that moment at the moment, but, and you're probably going to avoid some place like, um, uh, <laughs> uh, Puxatani because that actual word is a uh, Lenape literal translation of Mosquito Town. So, you know, these were the, these were the things that we left behind. And so, um, I, I, again, I apologize. I don't know. I, I don't know if I, but that is a, a indicative. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that, and I just, I, I think that, again, like you, your question highlights our experience, our American colonial existence. The, the islands historically, not knowing that one, but those islands in the, in the river historically would always have been rest spaces, um, sometimes burial spaces. Um, I don't think we would have planned burials there. It may have been something that happened, um, but they've all been used as points of rest, points of uh, you know meeting together before we go back down or back up. So all of those islands hold that significance in that way. Thank Onishi. you so much. That's a terrific place. I think we're going to have to close it up. Tina's giving me the high sign from the back. And please join me um, really with a very warm thank you so much for our panelists today. Please stay, please stay tuned for future programs that will continue this discussion. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much.